Okay, I'm feeling very um, boundaried and safe and structured because I am with two Capricorn heavy placements right now. We have um, two Capricorn stelliums on the show today. Wow. <laughs> They're both just nodding in agreement for listeners who can't <laughs> see. <laughs> They're like, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really understand Capricorn energy until I met, um, in full, until I met our current guest who we'll introduce in a moment. She's a Capricorn rising. And rising signs are sometimes the most outward expression of that signs energy. And so a um, little bit about Capricorn, uh, maybe to preface this episode, Capricorn in medical astrology is uh, rules over the the bones and the anatomy of the body, right? The bones. Yeah, the whole structural system, spine. Yeah. So it's perfect. It is perfect. I don't think that I even really knew what it meant. Wow. Um, if you're not on the, on the YouTube, YouTube, hop, on, the hop YouTube. on right now. <laughs> I love when we have props in our openers. It makes right? it so fun and exciting. It's Same. just on my desk. Like that's literally just, I have nothing else on my desk. It's like very tidy. Shocker. But that's <laughs> amazing. Perfect. I mean, our listeners know that I am Capricorn moon, Capricorn stellium, the seventh house. But again, like you said, I don't think I even really fully knew what it meant to step into that Capricorn energy until I met today's guest. Wow. Because I, this is my new thing is I think everyone should hang out with people who have the rising sign that is their moon sign. So like I'm a Capricorn moon. Mm -hmm. Today, our guest Adelaide is a Capricorn rising and like you're rising, you're just like, you innately are that outwardly into the world. It's how people see you. And so it's just like this natural energy and this overall um, kind of like intuitive thing that operates your whole chart and sets your whole chart and all the houses into motion. So I think everyone know what your moon sign is and then go find a rising with that placement and go hang out with them. So we have Adelaide Meadow on the show with us today. Um, we have, she has a Gemini sun, Libra moon, Capricorn rising. And Adelaide, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what magic you bring into the world? Yes. Um, okay. Right off the bat, I want to say you saw me drinking tea and I have ginger in my tea and I just like spit it out. And so if you got to see that, oh. like, that great. <laughs> just like presence that right off the bat. I um, did not even well, hop on the YouTube if you want to see that. If you want to see just, yeah. So there it is. Um, so yeah, my name is Adelaide Meadow and I um, own and run a small business called Small Magic Birth. And I am a traditional home birth midwife, a physiologist, a body worker, and an educator. I work in holistic women's health from a functional medicine perspective. So I run a small well woman care practice where I see women for all the things you might previously go to the gynae for, such as pelvic pain, yeast infections, STIs, um, painful sex, birth control, I don't know, bladder incontinence, whatever, all that stuff. Um, so I run a small practice seeing women in that regard. And then I also um, attend home birth for just some amazing, wonderful women who want uh, radical home birth attendance. And then, yeah, and then I do a lot of educating. So I am a speaker and I work in some nurse practitioner residency programs doing education for healthcare professionals and yeah, and I travel around and talk about how your body is fucking genius mm-hmm. and it's designed for brilliance and how you can really harness that and understand your own brilliance to live a more vibrant and comfortable female life. Mm. Yeah. And, and you really have a skill for like zeroing in on the basics and like again talking about Capricorn like the structure and really starting like literally in our bones in our body and how we like move sit stand breathe walk as women so maybe maybe where we should start with this is Keely's experience in your female pelvic centered yoga class for the first time because I think it gives a good juxtaposition I feel like Keely, you've talked about yoga on the pod before and how it's just always been so painful for you. Yeah. My goal for, yeah. Yeah. My self-proclaimed goal for 2021 was to make yoga not hurt. 
Um, wow. And to dance more. Accomplished. Yeah, but <laughs> here we are, so, accomplished. I feel like I should have put that in my self-introduction, but I've taught yoga for over a decade. And um, yeah, and I teach yoga in the Iyengar style in sense, so not the like vinyasa style that or power yoga that many of you are maybe familiar with. So it's sort of, it's coming from a different lineage, but also I stepped away from that lineage in formal study because it's all based on male pelvic anatomy, but it is still really coming from a, um, a spiritual and a scriptural uh, basis and a really structurally integral foundation in mm -hmm. how we approach movement. And so, um, yeah, I kind of incorporate that into my movement for the female body and like physiological teaching, which is what I was doing at the women's festival where I got to uh, meet you, Akili, which was so lovely. Yes. Amazing. I mean, the festival changed my life in a thousand ways, but um, one of the key things for that for me was, well, it's kind of hard to tell because I mean, it was so like radically different like living wise than just like my normal daily life living in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, like we were in the Blue Ridge mountains and I was sleeping in my hammock every night and I couldn't tell you where my shoes were. I was barefoot for five days and sleeping under the stars and, um, you know, just grounding 24 seven, um, and just being around by around so many just like women in their power. And like, Oh, it was incredible. But um, one of the things I did every morning was go to your yoga class. Um, and the first yoga classes I've ever done that I've been able to like get through without like writhing in pain um, or just being like very uncomfortable. And um, then I went to your workshop. Um, and I mean, that was a couple of days into the festival. So um, yeah, it was, I just remember being in there and I know we talked about this and um women were just kind of like sharing like what their bodies were feeling and like what pain they were feeling. And, um, our listeners know that I've just like lived this life of like chronic health issues and, um, you know, like autoimmune type things and just like very serious traumatic health related issues. And I remember you had us like turn to a partner and just like, I remember it saying, you saying like, tell your partner, like what you're feeling in your body or like what hurts right now. And, um, I remember you saying that that isn't actually what you said, but that's what I heard. Um, but <laughs> I just remember I turned to this girl who I had just met and I literally burst into tears and I don't really cry that much. And um, I'd been trying to cry the whole time I was at this festival and like couldn't make myself cry. Um, but then it was in that Healy moment. loves trying to cry. <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah. like that's, this my, that's my Capricorn moon cancer rising like polarity at war. Um, but yeah. And so I like turned to this girl who I like didn't know. And I just like burst into tears. And I was like, for the first time in my whole heck in life, I don't have anything to like complain about. Like I, I'm not feeling any pain. Like my eyes aren't burning. My hip flexors aren't feeling like the wraths of a thousand suns, you know, like I can, I'm sitting down comfortably for the first time in my entire life. And I've never been able to sit comfortably. Um, and yeah, it was, it was incredible. And then I got back and I remember I was like putting my hair up like, like two days after I got back and I like felt my neck and I've had like scoliosis and like kyphosis for like years. And one of the things I've been working like really intentionally on the last couple of years is like straightening like the top of my spine. Like I have, I had this like really intense, like Buffalo hump type of thing just from like the lack of alignment and like chronic, like neck pain and issues and spastic nerves and all these things and I like was putting my hair up and I was like I literally stopped and like turned and like looked in the mirror and like my spine was like the top of my neck was just like flat and I was like how did this happen like this wasn't like this before I left and it was like in a matter of like a couple of days my entire like body aligned itself mm. and I felt invigorated and I still do um that must be like the most fucking awesome testimony I'll think of like ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like typing it for your website. I'm like, like oh my God. Okay, yes. Okay. So, um, and also if I'm just like such a sap, like everything makes me cry. I don't know what in my, uh, chart allows for that, but literally everything I cry like a hundred times a day. And so I am just like, so touched by you and just like, I mean, I can't cry your whole episode, but just like, I'll like keep it together. But like by just the brilliance of your body, like yeah. your body is innately helping you every single second of every single day. Like it is doing, it's like incredible adaptogenic functions to help you. And the idea if we can just like help it like 10%, 20%, 30%, then like 
it will just take over mm. and your healing is actually exponential. Mm-hmm. And to be, um, I mean, this also just like calls into me sort of the metaphysical aspects of what healing and pain resolution can look like. And I know that's not necessarily the focus of today. Like we talk oh, about structure and the bones and my, you know, Capricorn stacks on stack, but like really can we be open to the idea that like harmony, harmony and healing are innate and that there is, um, that they are always available to us. Like in this moment, harmony and healing are available. Like they're not for a later moment and they're not necessarily for a moment that requires adjustment from this moment that they're available right now. And when you're thinking about like immediate rapid transformation that is possible in the body, like that to me is quite literally coming from not only incredible physiological changes, but also an alignment of metaphysical with physiological changes. And to me, that's like, the popping off topic for women in their bodies, because mm. to isolate women from their like essential healing nature is to isolate women from other women and to isolate women from their bodies. And to say that women's bodies aren't innately mystical is um, in my opinion, one of the primary modes of female oppression. Um, and just like a little aside, like we don't actually even know what happens at that moment of spark of conception. Like if we're talking about impregnation of I mean, I hate that word impregnation, but invagination, another more lovely term, right? Of like when there was actually a cellular change that goes from like not life to life, that was a bad snap. But like, you know, we can, like, we don't even know, like we don't actually get it. And there is some like magical secret that is inherently like creative that, um, and like spiritually uh, understood, but maybe not physiologically understood that is innate to female bodies. Uh-huh. And the more that we, and that happens in the pelvis and in her magical fucking genius, deep waters and bony structure, I mean, yeah. but like, so for us to somehow isolate that from the healing that you are able to achieve is, um, is anti-feminist, it's anti-woman. And it's also, in my opinion, um, fundamentally inaccurate, which, uh, you know, I really work in the realm of, um, of like health and science and I'm like a biology person and like, you know, study the sciences in school. So like, I'm not necessarily coming at this from a strictly uh, spiritual perspective, but coming from a deeply physiologically rooted and anatomy and biology perspective, I have come to see it demonstrated the innate connection between our spiritual embodiment and our physiological growth. So. Wow. So you studied sciences. How did you, and that was just a small part of your journey, obviously, how did you come to this place where you're so live, like everything that you're doing is so innately tied in and connected back to exactly what you just described of like the female body is genius and magical and amazing. Um, How did you come to this place? Is this a belief that you always held? Was it, I'm guessing it wasn't taught like that directly to you, like in school, but yeah. What was your path? Um, I, I'm thinking of what you just said. You're like, the female body is like genius and magical. And I'm like, is that the cliff notes for our podcast? Like, is there something more that we're talking about here? Right? Is it like <laughs> the show notes or whatever? Or is that just the show notes of your podcast in general? I guess I'm not totally sure. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, um, oh my God, where does the story start? I mean, I grew up farming, which like, let's just start with that fucking genius. So um, yeah, so and specifically livestock, like horses, goats, pigs, cows. So um, just actually seeing the brilliant, the brilliance of like mammalian bodies in motion, and also the brilliance of like every day, especially caring for specific animals. And I um, worked a lot with horses in my youth, and like would just like in like a care perspective, like daily care, and just coming in and seeing like and being able to notice or being required to notice like what is actually changing because that's an essential component of health is being able to observe changes in the body. So having that be something that was, that was taught to me and that was taught to me through farming, really livestock farming and being like, it's your job to touch and look and move and notice with your eyes and your hands and how things smell and what they look like and how they change every day because that's how we keep animals healthy. Mm -hmm. So like, that's fucking cool. Right. And so to grow up in a rural environment, like I'll never, um, you know, me, I'll live like deep rural forever. Uh, I'm like, you know, not a city girl by any means. And so I really think that that's innate 
uh, in my upbringing for sure. Um, and then, I mean, I don't know how detailed you want to really get into the story, but essentially my, um, you know, my love has always been kind of the intersection between religious studies and science. Um, so I originally went to school to be a physics major. Um, and then I changed and became a religious studies major and, um, then didn't finish school at all because I was too busy doing other shit. Uh, so whatever, but my interests in, in higher education or just in further education, maybe a better word have always been that kind of intersection between, um, between like the hard sciences and, and, uh, yeah. And God for lack of a better, uh, for simplest simplicity's sake. And then what was really sort of fascinating to me and what's unique in my story is I got very gravely injured when I was 21, um, where I got in a really bad accident and I don't really want to dwell on this, but I broke my back and my neck and my hip and my pelvis and, um, had a really severe head injury and lost my ability to read and write or to speak in sequitur speech. So I spent the next three years, a little more, um, really learning how to like read, write, walk, talk, listen, be in conversation. Um, and from both a neurological and a physiological healing perspective. And so being a young person and essentially like living in, um, the hospital and then also like living at home, but being in the hospital every day and living and growing from that type of chronic pain, uh, definitely was very formative to me. And specifically what was formative in that was not being able to communicate clearly and not being able to, uh, understand language clearly. Um, but being an incredibly embodied person, I was very like into my, at that time I was like training a lot and I was like very in really good shape or whatever. And so I had, um, intelligence about what was going on in my, in my personal body, but not cognition. And there's a very big difference between intelligence and cognition. So I didn't have the cognitive skill to be able to express, um, what I was experiencing, um, or to really understand what people are asking me about what I was experiencing. And that, um, endured for probably like two years. So in that time, really needing to hone my skills of like introspection and interoception, um, like understanding what's happening in my own brain from a neurological healing perspective in my own body from a physiological perspective and not necessarily having a ton of input or output during that time, which I think is really fascinating. Um, if we're thinking about, I read the other day that the, the amount of information in like a Sunday paper, like the New York times is the amount of in, in, is the amount of information someone would be exposed to in their entire lifetime in 1921. So hundred, right. So just thinking about, I was talking, talking about this with a pregnant client of mine, who's just like so wonderful. And she was talking about like limiting her input. And I shared that with her. I'm like, yeah, like limiting the input as crucial for healing and um, yeah. And I, my sort of brilliance of my body and its healing process is it made that, um, innate in my healing was the limiting of input and output. And also in that way really strengthened my, um, skill for understanding what's going on in the body. Cause I really had no choice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other fascinating thing is that I learned to communicate clearly as an adult in very structured, like this is where verbs go in sentences and this is how you form clear thoughts and this is how quickly you speak and whatever. And this is how you speak without a stutter and all the things that you learn if you're learning to do that as an adult. Um, just a shout out to all the speech language pathologists in the world. Uh, it's like they're really fucking helpful work. So, um, so I really also learned to communicate through talking about the body. Cause the first thing that I was really important for me to say is like, it hurts when this happens. Can you help me with this? This is what I'm experiencing. Um, yeah. And so my it's, they really grew together the ability to speak about the body and the ability to be introspective and then the ability to then communicate that out clearly all, um, in a sort of indirect, but also quite direct way was the, was my early twenties, right? That was me like 20 to 21 to 25. Um, and then, fast forward, right? So then by then I'm like, you know, teaching yoga and, but not really into yoga, like ironically, cause I was like, this doesn't really make sense for my female body and I don't really get it. And like, what, can you elaborate on that? I mean, I have an idea, but maybe listeners are like, what do you mean? It's not, 
good for my female body. Totally. Um, I'm like the anti-yoga yoga teacher. This is how I always refer to myself. I've been like fired from most yoga studios I've taught at over the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> Because I'm like, people are like, what about this? I'm like, do not, like, don't ever do that. Like, just like, don't. And they're like, but they say to do it. And I'm like, who's fucking they? Is it like, whatever. Okay. Yeah. So if we're just thinking about um, kind of the history of movement practice and really the explosion of movement science and biological sciences and understanding of our physiological, the physiology of movement really has just, it's changed so much even in my lifetime, um, which I'm not that old, right? I'm in my early thirties, right? So the amount um like how much we now know about the body is not necessarily uh like i mean is certainly not centered on the female body like let's start with that so so much of our gains are actually based on male physiology but then backing it up if we're talking about movement systems that we pull from specifically like yoga postures or like the yoga practice or strength training or pilates or ballet or also tap tap and jazz and modern and all these other types of dance um, they were largely made by male bodies and for male bodies. And so we're thinking about that specifically in context to the yoga practice. Um, I mean, we can do a little yoga history here, right? So Krishnamacharya is a teacher of two prominent, of really three prominent students, but we'll just talk about two today, of BKS Iyengar and Sri Pachabi Joyce. They both bring practices to the West. They have two different kind of um, schools that drop, uh, that like come from them and really are Hatha yoga um, and Iyengar yoga lineages are very structurally slow, meaning they're, they go extremely slowly. We use a lot of props. They're very much about the alignment and the bones um, with the concept being that how could we possibly learn to understand the nuances of the mind if we cannot understand the nuances of our toes? So start with what's real and work from there. So um, that's like an Iyengar yoga sort of tidbit. And then the other sort of mantra would be, um, uh, I'll come back to it because it's, um, okay, I got it. Uh, methodically, not mechanically, we integrate the parts, right? So there's a method mm -hmm. for integration as opposed to mechanical, meaning like biomechanical, right? And then the other lineage is uh, sort of what give us Ashtanga yoga or like our power yoga and then eventually our vinyasa yoga, um, which is the idea of like practice and all is coming, which that to me is like gag me with a spoon, right? Like <laughs> I would want to practice this shit and then I'll eventually it'll change my body. Like maybe, but like that doesn't actually make that much sense to me. So these are our kind of lineages that are coming down and they get, you know, mishmash with patriarchy and capitalism, although they were always intertwined, even in their emigration to the West. And we get our yoga culture that was still definitely coming out of like male teacher and then two like prominent male teachers and then influencing the yoga asana, meaning the physical practice that we actually see today in the West. And I want to be very clear here that this is not what we're talking about, like the eight living path of Mahavrata Buddhism or like other aspects of the yoga practice. We're talking specifically about the asana, which would be like the third step, so to speak, on the eight limb path all along. So I wanna really be clear that in my explanation, I'm in some ways separating this from the um, innate brilliance of the spiritual practice and the scriptures, mm -hmm. because largely in American yoga culture, that separation is far, far more distinct than I could ever even make it in this explanation. So like, mm. they're so divorced in our culture that I'm speaking to that in its divorced state. I just wanna make that clear. So blah, 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 blah. So then we get all these practices, right? We get all these practices and all these poses, right? The fucking poses, oh my God, people are showing me yoga poses. <laughs> It's like, what the fuck is this? Like, oh, I want to be able to do this yoga pose on Instagram. Like, why? Like, what are you doing? Oh, so you can just like be in your, like, get, like fucking likes because your ass looks amazing. Like, I mean, whatever. But like that only to me not feel sort of spiritually abhorrent, but also um, like for the long-term function of her like pelvic and like, I don't know, health and integrity. That's really like, even those postures are not actually based on, um, you know, really much at all in terms of like female integrity. And I could go on and on and on about this, but um, kind of the short, the shortened answer of my 10 minute answers to this question um, is like in a very functional way, the way we are taught to sit, walk and stand that is then reiterated in these practices, which might very well be like applied to them like in terms of how innate those postures are, if we're looking at like the history of the yoga teachings over thousands of years, 
that's like a little bit confusing and in some way lost to history. I'm sure there are historical scholars that would, you know, inform me more on that. But for the sake of this practice, if we're talking about our cultural mores on posture and how our bodies are supposed to like look and function, those have been retrofitted then to our yoga practice and then somehow tried to be expressed in the yoga practice, but they've also been retrofitted onto, I mean, all of our other movement modalities like dance and weightlifting and all these other things. So that we are then in this name of like caring for our female bodies by like exercising, being good for our bodies, we're actually like reiterating and not and essentially like somatically implanting these very specific mores and cultural values on how our bodies are supposed to look and function into our own bodies and then told practice and all is coming and then told practice them till the day is long. And then we wonder why we then actually begin to embody the pain of female oppression. It's like literally we're teaching it to ourselves and then women get taught to fucking teach it to other women, right? Then I, right, I used to teach in teacher trainings for yoga teachers. I no longer do this because shocker, I told them not to like teach yoga, which like didn't last before. <laughs> but like, but the idea, right, is like, we're then women teaching predominantly other women how to like embody in your tissues patriarchal structures that were built for your oppression, right? And then wonder why someone like Keely is like, fuck, my back always hurts. It never feels good in my hips. My, you know, like whatever, right? Or then women are like, oh, I gotta go back to yoga, but I do these postures and I have bladder incontinence postpartum. Or like, I'm told to do prenatal yoga, which full disclaimer, I do teach prenatal yoga is the only yoga class that I still teach on my sketch. But it's like, and it somehow doesn't feel integral. Right. Or I might say in many ways is directly contraindicated and creating the exact structures of harm that it's designed to allegedly un unravel. Mm -hmm. Right. And so having looking at how that has happened and why that has happened to me feels crucial to really our feminist reclamation of our bodies. Because if we can't understand how we're actually implanting oppression into our own tissues and how to specifically therefore practice liberation in our tissues. Mm -hmm. Um, then where does it begin, right? If not in the body, then where, right? If not in the body, then where? And then going back to my, my you know, many year study of the Iyengar method, which again, I've spoken some of my, you know, sort of concerns about that, but really that idea of like, you know, if we cannot understand the nuances of the body, then how could we possibly really expand that into the nuances of our spiritual inquiry? Um, and so that to me, there are many perspectives in which to enter spiritual inquiry. And that's just one from which that resonates with me. And that's where I teach from. Wow. Ooh. It's like when you're talking about the yoga teacher training, it's like <laughs> me with like doula groups and doula trainings. It's like, why do I keep getting kicked out of these? Oh yeah. Cause I keep telling women to not become doulas. Like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in that business too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That there's so many amazing things that you touched on, obviously. Um, I think one with back to what you were saying about like the newspaper um, being like so much more information than like we ever were meant to take in just that like lighting up of the nervous system and like being bombarded with information in that way but then also like we live in this culture of like we should be doing more we should be grinding harder we should like be taking in more information like all of these things and then that also translates like that kind of Emily and I've talked about on other episodes and things of like how that is a product of the patriarchy like this grind culture that like women are being con like forced to conform to in the name of like equality of like oh just go be a ceo like all the men but we're not going to do anything to support women in that way right um but like that is also being mapped onto like these more um like body-centric practices like yoga like for me it was like oh it hurts to do a downward dog like that just because your hamstrings are too tight you need to do more of them and like then like that is it was just perpetuating the problem it's like it's all about like doing more but then like when i was taken out of that and then i was at this festival and all, I wasn't expected to do anything. I just had to walk around all day barefoot in my little flowy skirt and do whatever the heck I wanted. And it was like, once I like removed myself from all of these other things that were being put on me and like back to like this, the most natural- Back to like, the kitchen, Kaylee. <laughs> <laughs> well, but back to this like, like 
most like ancestral, like kind of like part of myself, this natural, like strip everything away. It was like when I did the absolute least that I've ever done, that's when I felt better than I've ever felt. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, so I just want to like, you know, kind of speak here to the radical feminist implications of what you're saying. And I, I don't necessarily want to dive down in this rabbit hole, but like I try to sort of stay away from the world like natural or innate um, because, you know, there, I just think that there um, that can be sort of tricky waters when talking about our, our radical feminist reclamation. However, there is something really useful that I am like pulling from your explanation, which is like outside of the, of the oppressive nature of the male gaze. And it's like, how much of this is wandering around barefoot in your flowy skirt to whatever the fuck you want? And of course that feels amazing. And how much of it is also like, let's just remove the actual power of like what tells you that that is not okay. And what if your daily life where you actually went through your um, you know, daily activities and you spoke to this even being home and like feeling somewhat liberated in your body, like what does it look like to continue to embody uh, your presence outside of the male gaze, even though you are now met with that in society, right? And so I think that's really my interest is we live in, in a patriarchal oppressive culture. And so like our ability to actually be isolated from that oppression is for most of us, like not actually possible. Mm-hmm. And maybe for all of us, arguably. And so where this reclamation can really happen is that can actually be true in your body, right? Or we can start to unravel it in your body and your body can take, you can take your body everywhere. Like that is actually, that is innate to you. Well, maybe the rest of it is, is not. And I, I feel like that sounds a little wishy-washy and maybe not that clear, but, um, but yeah. And I am thinking just about what, yeah, just about what was available to you and like what actually allowed you to be free from mm-hmm. pain. And, um, and how nuanced that really is and how that is something that can be learned. And like, that's kind of the crux of a lot of what I do is like, you can learn to be in less pain. And for me, you're talking about like, oh my God, the thing you didn't see me, if you're not watching on the, on our YouTube recording, but like me just burying my face in my hands when they tell you to do more down dog, cause your hamstrings are tight. Like, oh my God, first of all, there's not just things, a tight muscle, right? That's another, we're not even going to go into that, but tight muscles don't exist. And newsflash, neither do hip flexors. I put that in quotes if you're not watching me, right? Hip flexors, hip flexion is a thing. Hip flexors are not really a thing. And tight muscles are also not really a thing, but like I digress. Um, But the idea that somehow doing something that is causing you pain more, right? Yeah. Is somehow going to, be of use to you. I think of the incredible um, radical feminist Serendipity Day. And if you're not familiar with her, please go follow her. She's epic. Mm -hmm. Um, And she defines patriarchy as anything that causes physical pain to women, Mm -hmm. anything that causes physical pain to women. So uh, like plucking your eyebrows or your nipple hairs or wearing shoes that aren't comfortable or wearing clothes that constrict your waist or walking in a way that is not integral for your pelvic floor, like anything that causes women physical pain. And that to me is is a really revolutionary definition of patriarchal oppression and one that is learned and therefore one that can also be unlearned. So when people say that like, you know, people are like, oh, you're like a radical yoga teacher or like whatever, whatever. And I'm like, I don't really know. Like that doesn't actually feel that true to me anymore in the sense of like what we're actually teaching is feminist liberation, um, like through the lens of the body. Mm -hmm. And I study a bunch of different movement modalities, yoga being one of them. And from a spiritual perspective and scriptural perspective, I absolutely am grounded in that scriptural, you know, sort of narrative amongst others. But I, yeah, like, like what, like this again, like what is the yoga practice, right? Like that's a question for maybe a different podcast, but in terms of like, what it is that you're experiencing in your body and how all these different ways you can practice liberatory practices, as opposed to practicing something that's causing you pain, which circling back to serendipity might actually be practicing patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Like what does that actually look like and how do you do that? And this is my message. I want to say, sing loud and clear. It's like, you can learn to do that. And again, coming back to my personal story, I now live a life that is 
for the most part, free of musculoskeletal pain, which is fucking insane. I broke my neck, I broke my hip, I broke my back, I broke my shoulder, I had to learn how to walk, blah, 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 right? I could tell you all the reasons why I should be in chronic hip and back pain. And guess what? I'm not. And I'm not, not because of the years of PT that I did, not because of all these other things, but because I believe that there is innate function that can be found through learning and studying from women and through learning to look into your own body and ask the questions of what would it actually be like to not be in pain? And what are your individual answers to that? And I can offer you a bunch of physiological suggestions because God knows I love my anatomy and physiology and will talk your ear off about the genius of fascia and the functions of your liver and like the way your musculoskeletal system is arranged and all of the ways that this information can inform you. Um, but ultimately, like the healing is actually available for you. And like you found how much of it is going to my genius yoga class, like maybe some of it, and how much of it is actually just available because you removed the thing that, in my opinion, is the primary cause of, of, of physical pain to women. So. Totally. Can you talk about the difference between male-centered movement and female-centered movement? Or maybe just like what you say or what you mean when you say the way that we you know, learn to walk, sit, stand, all those different things that are in, in, inherently designed for male bodies versus female bodies? Yes. Um, as Keely was so intelligently remarking, yeah, our very culture is designed for a sense of like outward productivity, um, which I wouldn't say is inherently like male or female. I would say women are inherently creative and potentially like the most productive um, if we're thinking about like, you know, what we actually can create in our bodies in terms of childbirth, but also just like create in our communities and like, you know, I'm not, I don't like to sort of draw that distinction. Mm -hmm. However, the way that that productivity is valued, I do think fundamentally value skills that are, um, that are harmful to women, right? That take women away from other women and take women away from things that they are potentially interested in and be that through I mean, our financial system that makes it less capable for women to make money and do the things that they're interested in, or even, you know, sort of what Keely was saying, and you were joking about like back to the kitchen and barefoot, like whatever, like if that's actually what you want, like then certainly our culture is not accustomed to that, while also somehow oppressing us and putting us in that role. So it's this like real complex, um, you know, sort of system of forces where like damned if you do, damned if you don't. So we are operating in a societal and cultural context that, you know, kind of binds women in that way. And I mean, again, that's, you know, we can go into feminist theory and all the ways that happens, but maybe that's not the question at the moment. The question is then like, so that's one way, right? That our world is just not designed. Mm -hmm. But then on a physiological level, um, let's stay with the way we're taught to stand, right? I'm gonna give you some very nitty gritty. Um, I'm actually gonna use my pelvic model, if that's okay. And I will describe it. So if you're listening to the podcast, hop on YouTube, but I will be clear with my language as well. So our, so this is a female pelvis, right? This one's even still a little, I mean, it's marketed as a female pelvic model, but it's like, I mean, I still think the hips are a little narrow in the front for many female pelvises that I've seen in the wild. Um, but this idea of like the uprighted posture, just that in alone, like stand up straight. Oh my God. Even that language is based on this idea that our pelvis is uprighted and sits like below our ribs, below our shoulders, below our skull which fundamentally is not true if you have a female pelvis, right? Which phew, mind blown, right? That's just not even a real thing, right? So if you have a female pelvis, your pelvis is oriented to have what's called an anterior tilt, meaning um, like the whole thing is angled somewhat forward where your pubic bone is therefore allowed to drape underneath or maybe not drape, the bones don't drape, but to really be stationed underneath the frontal hip bones. This is therefore allowing for there to be a deeper curvature in the low back and more spaciousness in the pelvic floor. So the coccyx or the tailbone can therefore create more of a distance between your pubis or pubic bone and, um, and like the back of your pelvis. And if you're thinking about the fleshy um, landmarks, that would be like your clitoral hood to your anal mouth, that distance, right, is designed to be spacious, not congested, right? And one of the primary reasons it's designed to be spacious and not congested would be childbirth, right? We don't want to be compressed in those tissues because that's the portal from which our babies enter the world. But even aside from childbirth, having those tissues be able to be spacious and buoyant is essentially, um, is essential, I should say, 
for full diaphragmatic breathing. It's essential for the, um, for the firing of our gluteal muscles. It's essential for the firing of our low back muscles. It's essential for the full integrity of our abdominal muscles, both front side and back, right? And all of that musculature firing and moving in concert with the breath is what can allow for hip and pelvic stability. So if I'm talking about the number one reason women would seek out my bodywear practice, or in many cases, even my well woman care practice, it's like I have uncomfortable, like I have painful sex, or I have low back pain that's kind of debilitating to me. And then I have that and I'm like, oh, do you also have yeast infections or do you also have UTIs? You're like, oh yeah, but they're unrelated. No, they're not, right? If the entire way that we're like sitting and standing based on that just, you know, relatively cursory example of pelvic arrangement, is physically limiting the amount of movement of our musculature and therefore also movement of blood flow and then also movement of synovial fluid and then also movement of lymphatic fluid and all, all of those, you know, very biological, um, you know, fluids for like a better word. And then also the kind of metaphysical and emotional, which goes right in line with the actual structure and movement of our, of our physiology. Like if all of those are compromised, of course they're connected. And why might you be having, you know, limited space is say, you know, your tailbone is usually allowed to have some room, but then you're sitting all the time in an uprighted position. And you're quite literally closing the room, the space between your tailbone and your coccyx or your anal mouth and your clitoral hood, right? And if that space is becoming congested, then it's not having all of its prime biological functions. And then those tissues begin to atrophy. They become more prone to infection. They become um, like number because there's not as much circulation to those tissues or the nerves become deadened because they're constantly in pain. And then we have less, less sexual pleasure because those nerves aren't fully enlivened and they're full expression state and on and on it goes. And that's just one small example of like one pelvic posture. To be clear, that's not actually a small example. That's a huge fucking example of the way we, of the way we stand. But those are just, uh, those, structures and like the way to stand, like suck your belly in and pull your shoulders back. Like who hasn't taught that from since childhood? And then where hasn't that message been reiterated in potentially every movement practice you've ever done? So then we begin to really solidify our musculature to hold us in a way that is ultimately trying to mirror male biology and in that way limiting the function of our female biology. Mm -hmm. And I know you um, talk about the like that patriarchal messaging of like, yeah, when you put your shoulders back and you're like putting your heart outwards, like opening up to men. Open your heart, ladies. <laughs> oh my God. Gag me, right? No, no, no. Your heart's for you, sister, right? It's so ridiculous that somehow <laughs> the way we have to stand, it's certainly unrelated that we're literally shoving our breasts and our vaginas towards like forward towards men, those are completely unrelated, right? Like what the actual fuck? And I mean, I'm sure I could write some really well-spoken essay, you know, about or well-written essay about how blah, 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 they're correlated and somebody could argue me in some academic way. That's fine, whatever. But like from a very practical perspective, like that's actually what's happening. So whether right. you say that that's like unrelated or not is kind of irrelevant to me if the result is that you're shoving your breasts and your vagina towards other people and then being told to open your heart as opposed to like, what does your heart actually need? What's actually gonna strengthen your backbone? What's gonna help you stand in your full power? And like in a very literal way, like what's going to allow your muscles to stand in their full, like powerful expression. Like this isn't metaphysical. Like what actually is going to range your bones and your muscles for ultimate like power and output. Like if we're talking about like from a physics perspective, like how much, how far you can throw something. It's like your back bones will literally strengthen. You'll have more bone and tissue. Like your muscles will, will actually create more power and output. So when we're talking about like women standing in your power, like or strengthening your backbone, like these aren't metaphysical. These are actually physical. And the practices we're talking about are anti- like uh, not the ones that I'm sharing or that I mean many other, I'm not the only person who does this work, but if we're talking about the practices that you're taught, like all these other movement modalities are quite literally antithetical in many circumstances, not universally, but in many circumstances to that strengthening, which is allegedly what we're trying to do, right? And we can hear all that spiritual discussion in all the yoga, vinyasa yoga classes we wanna to go to where you're like laying over block to open your heart to like, you know, heal your wounds or whatever, but then why are so many women in pain? 
<laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm literally like trying so hard not to like emote and like scream like yes every time you say something because like I want <laughs> all of your words to be like heard but like wow internally I'm just like screaming at everything um I think one of the biggest themes that we speak of pretty much every single episode is this concept of like you are not broken like there's nothing wrong with you and everything that I'm hearing you say is like what if we fundamentally believed that right like how many things would have to change because it's predicated on this idea that like we have to go to more classes and we have to do more things and have all these like all these services and everything to help us get back to a state of healing, which you said at the beginning, like, I think you said balance and healing is harmony. Just, yeah. Harmony. Or even available. getting out of this mindset of like, we're constantly healing, but then we never actually reach the wholeness because then the, the payment plan stops, you know, once you're like, feel better. Right. Oh, oh the payment plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. also you're talking about all these services and I'm like, oh yeah, don't worry. That doesn't make anybody any money. Like, I feel like this is why I've also, you know, am like trying to like sort of change the way I even run my own business to be, have a huge educational platform because I find like, unsurprisingly, I don't have like all this client retention. No shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I'm like, you can just learn to do this yourself and you can teach this to all your friends. And they're like, you know what I mean? And then unsurprisingly, <laughs> these women do not remain my clients for years. They don't like come back to, you know what I mean? Especially now that I don't teach like public yoga classes or whatever, but where people could come every week and practice this stuff. Cause like, that's sort of yeah. dream to be able to do that. But, um, but yeah, it's so monetarily driven, which I mean, that's a whole other discussion of who gets to make money and why and for what, but um, I'm sorry. What was your question? No, we were just reiterating that, yeah, this doesn't, this idea that we are already whole and complete as we are, doesn't like serve the greater systems at play. Like there are so many industries that exist because we think that we're broken or like that there's something wrong with us instead of looking outward at like what's wrong with the things that are like affecting us and like we talk about this with health looking at what kind of world we live in what kind of environment we're immersed in what kind of toxins are in our environment versus like oh I'm just like a sick quote quote sick person like instead like taking on the mindset of no, I am healthy and balanced and whole and healed. And there are things that I need to adjust in my environment to like help support that. Yeah. I mean, that's brilliant. And, and I think like I was reading something the other day that like sort of mapped the difference between like being a young person and thinking that like it was kind of just like chance and genetics whether you got sick and then maybe being in your 20s or thinking that it was like healthy lifestyle was how you prevented getting sick and then the older I get the more I'm like what even is it to be sick or is everything that I'm experiencing or that my clients are experiencing actually genius and adaptive to the environment in which we live and so really only pointing to the further brilliance and function of our bodies and our physiology and not to totally. the function of our biology and physiology so that is now the um the sort of lens from which i i i work is how genius your body is and how well adaptive it is to its circumstances and in that way how can we actually change the circumstances in order to actually live more fully in our female lives and like oh i mean for me like i mean what are some circumstances that are here oh my husband he's a fucking radical feminist right so that's one way that i change the circumstances of my life is i like chose a life partner who is going to be uh you know down for this like we were just walking I, I I care for my elderly mother and I was walking and she's my neighbor too she lives like two blocks away and so I was walking home and he was walking me home the other day and I'm having some like you know soreness in my left hip I know I said I have no pain but I guess I have some pain right I broke that hip and I am forever like really working with it and its functionality 
And part of this means I now walk like so slow. Like I like saunter and I like be sure that I like step into my left leg like fully and like rotate the hip every step, which just means I'm just like swaggering. Like I'm just like walking so slow and just like moving my ass essentially. And he's like, we have somewhere to be. And I was like, we now walk at one mile per hour. Like, this is just how fast we go. Like, and I'm six feet tall and I can like speed walk and like be a whatever, be like a busy person, like walking like I have a stick up my ass. Or I could just slow the fuck down and my hip would literally not hurt by the time I got home. If I walked like that for 10 minutes, it would probably feel way better. And so again, just like adjusting the conditions, right? Being in an environment where I can just say, no, I'm actually just going to walk at one mile per hour. And you're actually just going to support me in doing that. Like that's huge. And how can we adjust those conditions? And I feel like the more that we understand what the conditions are, like it begins with us, like our conditions are first and foremost in our own body. And so not feeling like this is needing to like adjust the whole world to suit our feminine bodies, but we can start by adjusting our internal world to be more suited for our, you know, female expression, which is, I think if we can't start there, then where, um, yeah. So even just these ideas, like you were saying, like, what is, uh, like, what is health and like, how does that change and how adaptive and brilliant the body and brilliant the body is. So, oh, I actually have a good example of this. Would you like an example? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I recently, so I, um, I would say to say that I train jujitsu is maybe like a little bit of a uh, ex- exaggeration. I like go to a lot of jujitsu and I work at a jujitsu gym and I help jujitsu athletes and other combat sport athletes be in less pain. Like that's true. But how much I personally do this is like, you know, whatever, up for debate. But I have this client who is an incredible jujitsu athlete. She's a fucking monster. She's so, she's like five feet tall on this like little comeback person. She could like kick your ass. She's a monster. She's amazing. And she was in, she was training and she tore her labia training, which she was like, there's a lot of like open leg and like closing your legs around people in jujitsu. And someone like put a knee and like caught her labia and then she tore it, right? (gasps) I know. She didn't know. She's like, ooh, that hurt. She felt like she got like punched in the vagina, but then continued to train for like two hours because like adrenaline and boss bitched him. And also, you know, there's probably some other stuff wrapped up in there, but whatever. So, and then she had this fork went home. It was like, oh my God, what the fuck am I going to do? She went to the hospital. They were like, you need all these vaginal stitches. And then no one fucking told her and whatever. And then she was like, my vagina is broken. And now I'm terrified that every time I have sex, that I'm going to like break my vagina, whatever she had, which like, obviously she felt that way. Cause no one gave her any edu- education about it, whatever. And so she came to me and this had happened maybe like a month or two before she, before she became my client and was like seeking out someone to help her. And I just explained to her, I'm like, vaginas are meant to tear. Like they're designed to do this so that you don't tear your musculature. Like this is a perfectly innate and functional thing and they're designed to heal. And they're also designed to heal in a more integral way so mm-hmm. that you actually have more resilience and more function in your tissue. So it's less likely to happen again. And that blew her fucking mind. She was like, I'm not broken. I'm like, no, probably next time if you happen to get kneed in the vagina and jujitsu, it's probably less likely to tear, not more. If we actually help this healing along and right. don't just like neglect it and tell you to do all the like things that they told her to do, which were effectively useless in my humble uh, opinion. And, you know, whatever, she got stitches, which is not, would not have been my choice. But even though she had actually also previously experienced the stitches, which in her words, were far more painful and traumatic than the actual tear. And she was terrified and like put up on this, like, you know, we can all picture how that would go down in a medical setting. So she had this really, uh, you know, like experience that happened to her as a competitive female athlete um, in combat sport, right? Where that's already kind of like a super male dominated situation. And then went to this really male dominated like environment, like the hospital and was told that her vagina was fucking broken and that they like, you know, didn't even really believe her that it wasn't like a sexual violence issue and like kind of haul this whole thing. So she had to like defend herself in that setting. And then everything really was able to change for her when she was like, this is actually innately functional. My body is being brilliant, not a problem. And this is what it looks like for female athletes to compete at an elite level. If we actually could do this in um, right relationship with our biological integrity, as opposed to in um, like conflict with our biological integrity. And I mean, that's kind of an extreme example, but I think it is really illustrative of, 
of this point of like, there's nothing wrong with us. We're able to do all the things that we want to do, but how can we do them in a way that is ultimately female centered and how unsurprisingly that's going to make us not only feel better, but be more functional and um, probably fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my that's my example. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, and for listeners at home that maybe don't, is it practice jujitsu or is it? Yeah, yeah. she's like jujitsu player. Yeah, or whatever. yeah, train jujitsu. Right. Um, you spoke of like changing your circumstances. Are there things that if listeners are just listening to this and maybe feeling overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, I'm not living my most self, female self-centered life. Like what are some things that you can implement? Um, maybe their entire like exercise regime is centered around like yoga or other things that maybe bring them pain. Like what are some ways that we can start deconditioning and unraveling some of this mm. stuff? Such a good question. Uh, the first thing was like, we love you and you're perfect and like this is a like a process of undoing and you're not like dumb or wrong or whatever um i teach this to healthcare professionals consistently and like other movement professionals right so like people who study this shift for a living find this like new and confusing information so just, you know, give yourself a deep breath. And, you know, if this all feels new to you. Um, the second thing is let your pain be your teacher, right? So if you are in chronic pain and there are things that you do consistently that exacerbate your chronic pain, one, join the club, <laughs> right? Like you're not alone. That's like, I mean, I can preach all this, but you think I don't still like see clients on Zoom calls and stare at my computer for like hours and like even teaching this stuff. Like I see clients on Zoom teaching this stuff. You know what I mean? Like the irony is not lost in me. So I'm right there with you and forever learning ways to kind of implement my um, embodied in the most truest sense feminism in my daily life. So, you know, we're right there with you, but really let your pain be your teacher and notice like what is causing your discomfort and then how specific can you get? Like the exercise that I like to try is like, could you put a boundary around your pain? Like, where does it literally, like, where is it and where is it not, right? So if your hip hurts, like, where does it not hurt? Like, are you clear about where it does not hurt? And then you're like, yeah, my nipple doesn't hurt. I'm like, all right, if it's that far away, then start like walking towards it in your mind's eye until you're like, huh, that's the differentiation where like where it hurts and where it doesn't, or where you experience pain or where you don't. And then we can start to look at something systemically because often it's not just like this one spot. Usually it's like a region and there might be like pain density that fluctuates being like it's pinpointed here and it's stabbing, but maybe it's duller or achier here. And it kind of like permeates and has this different nature. And the more you actually get to understand the nature of your discomfort, the more you can really attend to it lovingly. Um, so that would be kind of my my second thought is like, get to know what your discomfort is like and what it's telling you. And often just even noticing where you're not in pain can be diminishing of pain, right? So that's really huge as well. Um, and then from a structural perspective, stop talking to your tailbone. Just don't do that. If they tell you to do that in bar class, don't do that. If they tell you to do that in yoga class, don't do that, right? If they tell you to do that in weightlifting, don't do that. Just don't do that. And one thought is if you sit in a chair or a car, or at a desk or at a computer, you're likely tucking your tailbone for as many hours a day as you are sitting on it, right? So if that's all right, like, and to be clear, I'm sitting in a chair, staring at my computer screen right now, like I'm right there with you, right? So, but as many hours as you're doing that, you're probably already pr practicing that action. And I wanna be very clear, there's nothing wrong with that action. That's a functional action of the body, right? We're meant to move in all these different ways, but the overemphasis on that and the inability to do the, the uh, you know, to like, to like lift the sit bones and be in that like lifted low back and pelvic integrity shape um, and like have your low back muscles fire essentially, like we then become atrophied and lose that ability, which I think is a huge contributor to a lot of hip, low back and pelvic pain, which I would say most women that I meet experience to some degree. So don't tuck your tailbone, like lift your sit bones, right? And then the last sort of tip here is abdominal strength for women is actually different than it is for men. So the emphasis on like, 
oh, your back hurts, do more core work. Like literally forget that. Like that's actually just like, I mean, there's some truth to that, but like how nuanced that is and what that means, I feel like is there's, that's a whole realm of study that literally being told to do sit-ups if your back hurts is like generally gonna exacerbate the problem. So for women in our low abdomen, we have an organ, our womb and other organs of our sexual function that are actually sitting like inter, um, satiated with our abdominal tissues. Those literally aren't there in the male physiology. So this emphasis on like low abdominal engagement that we have, um, or like flattening your low belly mm -hmm. is coming from a, a, uh, like a physiological misnomer. Like that's not actually true for women's bodies in the same way that it is for male, for male bodies. I'm not saying there's not a huge benefit from having um, like muscular integrity in your lab, low abdomen and pelvic floor, but the way that is created is often very different from the quote unquote exercises, like the leg lifts or like whatever you might be doing or crunches that are generally designed for creating that muscle tone in a male bodied person, also known as men. Um, and sort of the last thought there is our abdominal integrity is really in our waist and in our upper abdominals, like between our ribs mm -hmm. in a different way than it is in our low abdominals, right? So how we, which is the most linked to the use of our intercostals, the muscles between our ribs and our diaphragmatic muscles. So the way that we breathe and the way that we stand are gonna have more of an impact on the muscles of our true like trunk and abdomen than a lot of the quote unquote core work that we have been taught to do. So um, yeah, that's kind of my Cliff Notes version. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Thank was you. incredible. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna I tell? Oh, oh, I was just gonna say, I love that idea of like knowing the, um, like putting a boundary around your pain. And like, that's like such an incredible way to think about that just in general, but also knowing all of your Capricorn qualities and like Capricorn being like, you're ruled by Saturn and like, which is the planet of boundaries and restrictions with the rings around it in a really like tangible way. So um, that's just like a fun way to think about that. And I just wanna sort of tie that all together with like what we learn in the body, like it starts in the body. Just imagine, right? Like, like we were saying earlier about like standing with back bone, like hold, like having your muscles hold you from the inside out, like putting a boundary around your pain, like understanding where you have ease and where you have dis-ease and that they're not pervasive. Like these are incredible actual skills for living an integrated heart fulfilled life. And they are practiced and they begin in the body. Right. So we don't like that blows my mind to this day. Right. That like what we actually need, like those skills begin in the body. Right. These aren't things that we and I mean, for me, I should say for me, that skill building begins in the body. And I think even if that skill building doesn't begin in the body for you, it can be practiced in the body. And like that is amazing. And that is like even all of the other like wonderful spiritual work that we can do if you're someone who really is like yeah, but now that really like connects with me or like, I don't really understand. Like they tell me like set up boundaries or whatever, like what, like, or like, I don't really get that. Like know that um, I'm here to support you. And like, if that feels esoteric or out of touch or not reality based for you, then you can actually practice things in your body and place physical boundaries. Like I use the wall often when I'm teaching anything where like, oh, there's a physical boundary. And like, how do you actually orient in your body to a physical boundary and how do you learn? And like, these things are not quote unquote related to the rest of your life. This is the rest of your life. Like your body isn't like related to your emotions. Like it's actually inter interwoven. So this idea that you somehow then need to like apply it elsewhere, like that just doesn't seem real to me. Like you are your body and you are not disembodied and your your female body is not distinct from any other part of you. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we can kind of bring the whole thing full circle, so. Mm -hmm. mm. And your body is in and of itself whole and everything's connected. And so when people are like, oh yeah, this is, I have this, but it's unrelated to that thing. Like that is just so, makes no sense to me, but. Well, the way I like to say is that that's not grounded in biological reality. <laughs> that's the term that I use. So. But um, I'm just gonna say this because this is a really wonderful opportunity. If you are interested in things that are grounded in biological reality and you want to have a deep dive study into the genius of the female pelvis and honestly just the, your female anatomy and physiology taught from a radical feminist perspective, I'm teaching this intensive on this um, in Puerto Rico 
uh, which if you're going to come to a radical educational intensive on the, you know, genius of the female body, why not do it in the jungle? Like why, you know, instead of me teaching this at a holiday inn in, um, you know, Sacramento, like come with me to do it there. Um, and so this is, you know, I'll be teaching movement practices and then also lecture every day. That's really weaving these structures in. Um, so we can leave with a more embodied understanding. So practicing them in our, in our own bodies and then really learning to uh, live them and understand them and really um, integrate these into our lives. So if you are, I mean, people who are coming are chiropractors and nurse practitioners and other midwives. So if you are, um, you know, a professional of some kind that works with women, this is really going to be uh, right up your alley. But even if you're not, and you're just like, I want to geek out, about the body and the pelvis, then definitely come because you will leave in less pain and with more integrated, you know, biological and physiological and metaphysical healing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yay. And where else can uh, listeners connect with you or stay in touch with you if they're interested in this retreat or get to work with you if they're near you? Yeah. So I have a um, physical studio where I teach and see clients and run my well woman care practice. That's in Ips, uh, my studio is in Essex, Massachusetts. I live in Ipswich. It's on the beautiful Cape Ann um, of Northern Massachusetts uh, on the coast near New Hampshire. So if you do live in, you know, uh, within, you know, driving distance, I see clients from all over the region that come here. Um, and then I also see clients all over the world for well woman care visits and um, like uh, like functional movement and postural stuff. So if you are interested in that, it's available to you as well. And if you want to figure out how to do all of this, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is uh, at smallmagicbirth. You can also uh, come to my website, smallmagicbirth.com. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter there. I uh, also wrote and illustrated a children's book about um, birth and the innate functions of the vagina. So if you, you can download that for free on my, on my website. And um yeah. And then I will, yeah, send out emails. So that's how you'd sign up for the email list and I'll send out email updates about educational engagement, speaking engagements. Um, yeah. Or I'll see you in person or come to Puerto Rico because what's better than, uh, than a seven day deep dive um, if you really want to um, step into the body in a profound way. Yes. So exciting. I'll be there. Heck yeah. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, we really enjoyed having you. This is amazing. Your podcast is amazing. I love all of your episodes. I love all the things you get into. You've introduced me to Disney. I've never seen any of these movies before the two of you. So just wow. thank The Lord's <laughs> work we're doing over here. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, well, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, women. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>